Well, let's continue on with our coverage. Let's get to the latest on the Israel-Hamas war. And for that, we bring in retired Marine Intelligence Officer and National Security Analyst, Hal Kempfer, as always, Hal. Good to see you. Let's get straight into the news. There's a lot to discuss. The Guardian reports that five people have been killed and 10 injured in Gaza when they were hit by a pallet of aid parachuted into the territory as part of a humanitarian airdrop. Witnesses said that the accident happened on Friday morning near the coastal refugee camp known as Al Shadi, one of the most devastated parts of Gaza after a parachute attached to the pallet failed to deploy properly and the parcel fell on a group of men, teenagers, and younger children hoping to obtain food and other supplies. You're looking at a tweet by U.S. CENTCOM denying that our forces uh, were responsible for this. Uh, what, what do we know about this so far, Hal? If not the U.S., who else is dropping aid into the region? Well, Austin, we do know that uh, obviously Jordan was uh, dropping aid, and they've been doing that before since before we are. It's not clear if the Egyptians are also dropping aid or if any other allied uh, nations might be dropping aid. It's one way to get in there. It's not a very efficient way of getting in there. It makes for a great photo op, but you can't drop that much. Uh, but it, you know, you parachute in. One of the problems with dropping aid uh, in humanitarian uh, operations like this is that the people on the ground see the parachute and of course they're anxious to get to the pallet so they can get whatever's inside. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes they will literally position themselves directly under a uh, parachuting pallet coming in. And it's not, uh, it's not unheard of that for people to get hurt, even killed in these operations. Now, obviously, if they dropped a pallet and the parachute failed, uh, well, then you have uh, a pallet full of uh, probably meals ready to eat uh, coming in pretty much at terminal velocity. So whatever it hits is gonna hit hard. It, in fact, it won't explode like a bomb, but you'll have stuff shooting out and you could have a number of people injured. The, the US watches this very closely. We have a lot of redundant uh, surveillance systems and, and we have said it wasn't our pallet. And I would say we can take that pretty much. Uh, it wasn't our pallet. Now, doesn't mean we watch every humanitarian aid operation going in and it could have been someone else's pallet. And of course the Pentagon says, they don't know if it was somebody else's pallet and they don't know if it was uh if this actually did happen too it wouldn't be beyond hamas to make up a story like this and and just to see how far it goes and and pretty much outside of the initial report it's tough to get confirmation on it so i'm i'm kind of taking a wait and see uh on this one to see exactly what did happen if the injuries and deaths did occur and if they were at what was reported and then of course to find out who who's parachute of pallet it was. Yeah, so well, what have we learned so far about this parachute method, this airdrop method? It's been happening now. I believe it started with the French, if I recall correctly. The U.S. has been involved with airdrops. Um, you know, we're talking eventually about this makeshift dock that they're going to be building, this pier they're going to be building in Gaza, but would we call this airdrop method a success so far? Well, it's a success in that it gets it gets food in there, but it can't get a lot. You got 2.3 million uh, Palestinian, uh, you know, Gaza residents, if you will, that are uh, that are all in need of aid. Uh, when they do this thing, I think yesterday or yesterday or today it was about 11,000 MREs that the U.S. dropped. Previously, it was about 38,000. So you can really see it's not much compared to the overall need. Now, when you start talking about uh, what they're going to do, uh, and by the way, I'm a I'm a former paratrooper. So uh, I'm very familiar with uh, dropping things from uh, via parachute. Uh, it's just part of how we do air, what we call airborne operations or air delivery operations. So it is a way it works. It's just, you can't deliver a lot of mass. Certainly with C-130s, you can't. C-17s could deliver more, but they're not using C-17s right now. Now, as far as this, the seaborne uh, concept, of course, as a Marine, uh, you know, going over the shore, that's kind of what we specialize in. And uh, among other things, I did command an expeditionary um, uh, marine logistics unit way back when, and uh, I'm very familiar with over the shore operations. There is a new thing, the Pentagon confirmed it today. We, we'd actually brought it up on air after the State of the Union last night, uh, here on Live Now, that it, they might be talking about the, the joint logistics uh, over the shore, J-LOTS, I should say, over the shore. Uh, capability. It is uh, something that's relatively new. It has been used in exercises. This might be the first operational use and one could say combat operational use of this system. Uh, it's building, uh, basically it's an offshore 
uh, logistics uh, pier, if you will. There's a variety of ways they can do that. And then you can actually build a causeway to bring it on shore. Kind of reminds me a lot of Normandy and the whole Barbary thing and everything we built on the beaches of Normandy, but it's not quite that extensive, but it, but it works. It's one way to get it. We're talking about being able to bring in 2 million meals a day. And each of those meals has about, you know, somewhere between 13, 1400 calories. Someone said, well, they need to bring in three, you know, three times that much in order to do it. The reality is 2 million meals would make a huge dent. And if you can get uh, 1200, 1300 calories into every uh, Palestinian uh, civilian uh, every single day, uh, that will stave off starvation. That will that will stave off malnutrition. There's a lot of stuff packed into those MREs, and it will keep them going. And then, of course, to increase the aid after that, so they can get more in there. Just to rewind for folks who may not have tuned into the stu State of the Union last night, a, a floating pier and causeway that will be used to deliver humanitarian aid by sea to Gaza is expected to take at least one month or possibly two for the U.S. military to build and become fully operational, Pentagon Press Secretary Major General Pat Ryder said today after President Biden initially announced the effort officially last night at the State of the Union. Uh, Hal, over 1,000 U.S. military personnel will be used to complete this mission, but U.S. military personnel will not put boots on the ground in Gaza, according to Biden and according to the Pentagon. How can something like this be accomplished without boots on the ground, or is that still to be determined? Well, they're, they're saying no boots on the ground, and, and I've certainly been in enough operations around the world where they say no U.S. boots on the ground, and we make absolute sure, <laughs> if we're in uniform, that we do not step on that whatever ground they told us to stay off of. That's an order. However, I'm sure they'll be using contractors, and there really is no way to do this without somebody's boots having to get on the ground because you've got these huge pallets full of aid coming in that have to, you have to move this thing to the shore and then you have to offload it from the causeway to somewhere where it's going to be distributed. Uh, I've heard they haven't quite figured out where who who takes delivery of the aid uh, when it gets there. It obviously won't be what used to be the government of uh, of the Gaza Strip, which would be Hamas. That's not going to happen. But it's not quite clear who would del who would take delivery of the aid, and at what point that aid would be moving from the causeway. Uh, that has been set up onto the ground and how they would do that. It's very possible to use uh, contractors. Yeah, remember, it's technically a contractor that built the system for DOD. So those contractors are available and we've used contractors in far more hazardous conditions than, uh, than the one that we're looking at in the Gaza Strip. So that's very possible. Or it could be working with a non-governmental organization on the ground, could potentially be working with the IDF. Uh, on the ground too, delivering aid directly to them, and then they would distribute it, that uh, that aid or work be part of the distribution process of that aid going to the uh, the Gazans. There's a variety of things that got to get worked out. I'm sure there's an operational planning group somewhere working on these details right now. So, uh, and let's pull up a tweet from our friend Sal Mercagliano. He's a uh, maritime historian that we bring on our air from time to time to help us break down these more complex uh, sea-related issues. Uh, a floating pier on the Gazan coast, Hal. This is a new one to me, and it'll be interesting to see how this actually plays out. There may be some concern that this could lead to trouble in some way. C could an operation like this pose a threat to people that will build and or use it? Well, uh, potentially. I mean, that was one of the things that was brought up is uh, we don't know, could Hamas take a causeway uh, under fire if it's within range, uh, that is possible. But it is a very, it's a, they really rigorously tested this system. They've used it in exercises, it works. I, I personally know Sal, uh, I've done uh, things, uh, events involving maritime security with him. Uh, I think what you're hearing there is, you know, there's, that's, uh, that's, you don't get much better experts than, than Sal in talking about this system. And, and what I would say is this system works I think it's a, 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 use, a, very, a very useful system to use in this particular environment. I'm glad they looked at this. This will give a chance to operationally test it uh, in, a, uh, you know, in, a, in a hazardous condition. Uh, but it also tells you something about the time frame. You know, when we went into, when uh, there was a big you know, landing at Normandy, when the Allied forces went into uh, Europe, um, in, into France, uh, that they were able to do all of that logistics set up within days. Uh, we're doing this something uh, far less ambitious, 
but it's going to take us probably a couple months until this thing's fully stood up. And I, and I got to tell you, there's a lot that can happen in a couple months. The uh, the the need of the uh, the civilians on the ground, uh, the malnutrition, the starvation issues, these are not going to go away. We can we can do airdrops, but we we've got to figure out a way to get more aid in sooner. This will be one way of getting it in there. I'm uh, I'm kind of wondering if once this thing's set up, that we may have already kind of worked through the problem with getting aid in by land uh, within 60 days. That's very possible, but. Uh, but we'll see. And and by the way, something did come out. Apparently, there is a road the Israelis have built right through the middle of Gaza, so dividing north and south. It's for security purposes. But when I looked at that road and what it is, it's like that actually might be a good road to bring in lots of aid to go into north Gaza and to certainly central Gaza uh, to help alleviate some of the uh, humanitarian needs. Obviously, the sooner the better in this case, and we're uh, going to be waiting to see how long this pier ends up actually taking. I wanted to ask you, you already touched on this, Hal, though. What are floating causeways usually used for? What could be some real-life uh, use case scenarios for something like this, technology like this? Well, uh, actually, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief operations are actually one of the things in mind when JLOTS and the whole JLOTS concept, if you will, not just the system, but everything that led to the system, uh, that was one of the big missions that, that, that the Department of Defense was looking at. Obviously, wartime missions, when you're going into a, uh, uh, a shore, which could be hostile, or there just isn't, you know, there, there aren't enough, um, you know, built up uh, port infrastructure to support what we need, or we wanna go into a place where we're moving into a, an area away from that built up infrastructure because of potentially say a threat situation uh, where we don't wanna use it. That's where this stuff, that's where something like this comes in. It, what it does is it gives us the ability rather than you know say an enemy force just targeting a particular port and saying, if we hold that port, we'll be able to stop them. Um, uh, not just you know Marines or, or troops coming over the shore, but that lo logistical sustainment over the shore could be put anywhere along a long shoreline, and which makes it very difficult for a group like Hamas to effectively target it over a long period of time because they're not quite sure where we're gonna bring it in. Depending on how it's set up, uh, it may be something, and this is something I'm sure they're looking at uh, in examining courses of action, is they might have multiple landing sites. In other words, this causeway could be set up one place, and then once they get through doing a certain amount of delivery, Maybe they pull it out and they put it in somewhere else in order to kind of keep uh, Hamas guessing as to where the causeway actually is on any given day. That's a possibility. I don't know if it's completely something they could do. I'm sure that's one of the courses of action that they're looking at right now, which they're gonna rule in or rule out, but uh, that's part of the whole planning process for an uh, operation of this, of this scope. The fact that the U.S. has now recently announced two significant operations in Gaza and neither of them focus on Israel's offensive, instead the U.S. is focusing on helping the civilians in Gaza, what does this say about how the U.S. views how Israel has carried out this offensive so far? Well, I, I, you know, without, without digging too much into the commentary, I think President Biden and uh, and Secretary Blinken and others have, have, have had some very strong words uh, for Israel in terms of how they're conducting this operation, uh, how, and, and basically, uh, and, and uh, dissatisfaction uh, with the humanitarian crisis that thing is, this, this entire operation has caused. Now, with that said, uh, the president last night in the State of the Union uh, explicitly mentioned the fact that, uh, you know, Hamas does use civilians uh, for uh, hu as human shields, essentially, uh, making this type of operation very difficult. Uh, and, and I was actually listening very closely to what he was saying on that to see if he's gonna say something, um, you know, particularly critical of some of the things he said outside of the State of the Union uh, message. Uh, I didn't hear that, but the U.S. is rather insistent. We wanna see a two-state solution as a long-term long -term, uh, end state. Uh, a separate, you know, sovereign Palestinian state, and a, and, a, and of course, uh, maintaining a a, uh, a a sovereign Israeli state side by side. All right, uh, that's something that neither side has uh, has completely has really agreed to, uh, and uh, and and trying to work through this 
uh, current crisis, which is this huge humanitarian need. Uh, as things have moved along, less aid is getting in. Uh, those who are hungry are now moving past hunger to starvation. And so there is a critical need to get in there and people are literally dying of starvation. Children are extremely susceptible to this. And, uh, and because of that, there is a, a strong political imperative along with a moral imperative, uh, humanitarian imperative to do whatever we can to get aid in there as fast as possible. This is the last thing I want to hit before we go. Uh, obviously, the situation in Gaza is dire, but uh, here's a tweet by the IDF. Today saying that operational activities continue in Gaza as IDF troops struck sources of fire and a weapons storage facility assessed to be the source of rockets fired toward communities in southern Israel eliminated approximately 30 terrorists in different areas of Gaza and located multiple weapons and demolished multiple tunnel shafts. Uh, Hal, a lot of our coverage lately has been focused around ceasefire talks, aid, wider conflicts in areas like Yemen and Lebanon and the looming Rafa offensive, but what has the IDF been up to in recent weeks, Hal? It seems they're still keeping busy in Han Yunus. Oh, it's still full combat operations. Um, they're, uh, they're you know, obviously in Khan Yunus, they're, they're continuing clearing operations, trying to secure that central zone, to secure that you know second largest city uh, in Gaza. Even when you control the ground, you don't control everything beneath the ground. And there is that, you know, what's called the Gaza Metro, that massive tunnel system that Hamas has built. So they're having to go through and clear that, destroy that. A lot of the more spectacular explosions that we've seen, uh, video of that, is actually blowing up the tunnel system underneath the ground, uh, denying Hamas the ability to use those tunnels uh, on a fairly permanent basis. And uh, uh, although when you do that, you often see buildings collapse because they'd so honeycombed uh, these areas to include the urban areas uh, with these tunnels. So it's a, it's a big problem. Uh, in terms of, of doing that and then not causing associated damage with other infrastructure in the area. They keep moving forward. They're actually still, they're hitting pockets of resistance up north, uh, up around Gaza City. So they're still having to work on that. And then of course, they're, they're doing what uh, basically called shaping operations, uh, getting ready for what will be a, a larger offensive into Rafah in the south. And all of this is moving into position, denying some key terrain to Hamas, going in there, working the tunnels, finding the tunnels, doing everything they can to reduce the tunnels. So when they do the ROF operation, uh, they can minimize uh, the uh, you know collateral damage or minimize the possible uh, damage, uh, or I should say harm to civilians in that area. The other thing though, is trying to get the civilians out of that area. And I think that's where some of this, uh, particularly that maritime side, uh, that maritime logistics thing, by having someplace they can go for aid and getting beyond meals ready to eat, getting into shelter, which is one of the items that they were talking about is moving in these uh, temporary shelters. If they can build these tent cities with shelter, sanitation, other things that the civilian population needs, that gives the civilian population somewhere to go. And they've got to get the civilians out of Rafa because otherwise, uh, the civilian casualties could be fairly extensive uh, whenever uh, the IDF does go in there. We're watching Gaza closely. Uh, for now, we're going to leave it there, Hal. Take care. Have a good weekend. All right. You too, Austin.